Hi, I'm Tom, W8JI. This is a modification to Collins 30L1. This modification is fully reversible. It improves the amplifier stability on 15 and 10 meters. It improves the IMD. It results in a longer duty cycle and you wind up with the same tube cost if you have to replace the tubes. This modification puts a pair of 572Bs in place of the 4811s. It's non-invasive. You can go back to 4811s and back to the original circuitry anytime you want to, really. Uh, if you use the two 572Bs, though, you get a lot of advantages over 4811s, in particular at the voltage that Collins runs the amplifier at. The 572B locating pins have to be at the 3 o'clock position. They may need trim slightly to fit through the Collins sheet metal. It requires a new parasitic suppressor system. You have to slightly shorten and redress the bus wires uh, to the loading capacitor. The one in the back is a little bit too close to the tubes. And you also have to watch the clearances of all these bus wires. You want to make sure that they don't bump up against anything else and uh, they're spaced at least a quarter inch or so from other pieces of uh, metal or other bus wires as they route to the band switch. Okay, and we see that uh, these are the Collins original parasitic suppressors. You see the resistor on the right is cracked. Collins used uh, 100 ohm 2 watt carbon composition resistors. A lot of people think that these carbon composition resistors, you can just use any carbon resistor if it sort of looks like this. But the truth is, a lot of the resistors that look exactly like these resistors are a carbon film resistor and they're inductive. They have a spiral winding and depending on how that winding is inside the resistor, it can be a conflict with the wire that's wound around the resistor. So you always want to use a carbon composition resistor, which is a special type. The only manufacturer I know of that makes a carbon composition resistor is Stackpole, and they're a special order component. This is the inside of a resistor type often taken uh, or mistaken to be a carbon composition non-inductive resistor and we can see very clearly that the substrate inside the resistor has a spiral winding of carbon around it so this resistor is actually inductive. The correct parts to redo the parasitic suppressor you can recover the clips uh, that are originally used at the top of the, t uh, top of the tube to connect to the anodes you probably need new braiding. Uh, you'll need 100 ohm non-inductive resistors. These are not just any old carbon resistor that you find any place. They're, a, you know, they're a special composition type resistor that, as far as I know, only Stackpole makes. You'll need some wire, uh, number 16 wire, uh, that's wound in a uh, in a size that will fit over the resistors. I wind the wire first and then clip off the amount of wire that I need from the coil and form it to fit over the resistor. It makes a little bit neater looking finished product. And uh, that's pretty much uh, the entire thing besides a couple pieces of uh, metal to go down to the uh, blocking capacitor to make the electrical connection to the resistors to support the resistors. This is the uh, final suppressor that I used. It's laid out on graph paper that's about a quarter inch per square and this gives you some idea of what you might need to do to have the suppressor work. Uh, this will fit either 572 tubes or 811 tubes and work a lot better than the original suppressor. The resistors are supported by a, um, about a 50 thousandths inch uh, thick copper uh, flashing that's cut to size and the resistors are rigidly soldered in the one end to keep the resistors in place. 
they're at probably about a 60 degree angle. That doesn't matter too much. People say it does, but there's not that much mutual coupling that it's um, there's any kind of a bad effect from this. The the only thing you want to do is be sure the resistors have some air gap in between them so that the turns aren't shorted out from one to the other. And then I use flexible braiding and then the original uh, 30L1 uh, anode connectors at the far end because they just fit better and and they look more original. Okay, here's another modification we do to the 30L1. It has to be done from the bottom of the cabinet, of the chassis. We add a L bracket to the back tab of the plate tuning capacitor. This does two things. It gives some mechanical support to the back of the capacitor so it doesn't work the front screws loose when the amplifier is jostled around in shipping. The second thing that it does is it shortens the ground path for the high circulating currents from the capacitor back to the uh, grids of the tube and the cathode of the tube by instead of having the current uh, the RF current run through this front panel down to the center panel and through the chassis and back to the tube sub chassis and the input of the amplifier uh, the ground currents can now just run directly through the uh, center panel of the amplifier back to the tube chassis where they are in the proper place with the shortest possible lead lengths. The other modification we do to the 30L1 is uh, involves removing the rear panel which isn't really that bad a job and then you have access to the bottom of the tube sockets. We, we change the um, grid resistors from a standard uh, uh, carbon or metal film type resistor, whatever happens to be in the amplifier you have, to a uh, Ohmite OX series resistor, which is a metal composition that can take a lot of arc energy without damaging the resistor. And so we will use like an OX220KE up to an OX470KE resistor, which is 22 ohms to 47 ohm one watt resistor and uh, these uh, any value in there is okay but you want to stay closer to the 22 ohm side if you can stay at that side because you have less grid voltage variation with grid current and that helps a bit on the uh, intermodulation distortion of the amplifier on single sideband by making the bias more stable on the control grid. Another modification we do to the tube socket side of the amplifier is parallel uh, 0 0.001 microfarad 1000 volt small disk capacitors across the 220 picofarad silver micas that Collins has from the control grids to the chassis. We do this because when the, the you know, the original idea Collins had was that was some kind of a voltage divider with the uh, grid cathode capacitance of the tube and that doesn't really work too well when the tube is in grid current because the the grid current is dynamically uh, changing the the uh, control grid to uh, to cathode impedance of the tube over the RF cycle so you get a really non-linear voltage developed across the 220 picofarad capacitor uh, bypassing that with the 0.001 helps settle that down which improves the IMD performance of the amplifier and it makes the gain uh, a bit flatter from 80 meters uh, up through 10 meters so the, the um, everything just sort of works better when you have a little bit more capacitance there and this is a modification that if you don't like it you can take it somebody can take it back out later on it doesn't, it's not a permanent thing. And the last thing that we do underneath the chassis of the, uh, where the sockets are in the amplifier, is we add a couple gas discharge tubes. 
which are much better than other uh, arc suppression uh, devices because they will handle uh, thousands of amps of current and not fail. So we put a, G we put a GDT, uh, 130 volt GDT, from each side of the filament of the tube to the chassis. Uh, you only need two of them to do this. And what this does is if a tube ever does arc, it provides a arc path to ground without going all the way back to the exciter. If you happen to be using a solid state exciter or something to drive the 30L1, it's a real good idea to do this. And finally, if you look at the very bottom of the picture, you'll see a black uh, power rectifier diode. That's a 1N5408. And we mount that with the uh, cathode of the diode to the chassis and the anode of the diode the end without the band uh, goes up and ties to the central bias point. This is so that if the tube arcs, if anything happens in the tube arcs, um, the positive voltage can shunt to the chassis, but this doesn't affect the negative bias voltage. And finally, I'm going to make a comment about the uh, input connector that somebody mounted in this amplifier. If you do something like this, instead of mounting the connector uh, cockeyed like this or crooked, which looks pretty bad, just put a notch in the connector so you can mount the connector horizontally so that it looks like it was supposed to be there. Okay, so I'm going to change uh, now to the video of testing this amplifier on the test bench with these modifications and a pair of 572Bs uh, replacing the four 811As. This is a completely reversible modification. And then just slightly retune the input circuit. So that's all that's, uh, that's, all that's done. This is a pretty accurate uh, peak reading meter. I build it myself and it's just kind of a bench meter but it's calibrated against a standard that's a good standard so it's reading the correct power levels. I'm on 80 meters and this is peak envelope power and with two 572 B's because of the high voltage the Collins has which is 2000 volts, a little over 2000 volts when it's just at low duty cycle um, it's about a thousand watts output on pulse. If I go to, so that's a tuning pulse, or if I go to carrier, it's 800 watts. I might be able to retune it and get slightly more. Nope, doesn't look like too much more. So it's about 800 watts on carrier. And you can see I'm not too worried about the carrier level on this with the 572s even though this is only two tubes. There's, uh, there's no sign of the tubes uh, getting uh, red. And the plate current here on this amplifier is about uh, 600 milliamps right now. And on carrier, the high voltage is about 1,700 volts. So it's working pretty good. Turn the carrier off. And we'll go to the next band, we'll go to 40 meters. And I'm just going to run through the rest of the bands with the tuning pulse. We're on 40 meters, and let's go here. I've made modifications in this in the grid circuit of the tubes, which will make it run better and have better gain flatness across the bands. So that's 40 meters, so it's about just under 900 watts with the uh, ICOM 746 driving it. And we'll go to 20 meters. And we'll go to 20 meters. And peak it up on 20. And there we go. Just over 900 watts, almost a thousand watts of output. And I'll go to a carrier once. There's a carrier, 800 watts on 20 meters carrier. 
standing wave ratio is good with just two tubes and we'll check the plate current the plate current here is about 600 milliamps again on on uh, 20 meters and let's see we'll go to the next band is 15 go to 15 15 meters and we should be there we go these amplifiers are a little touchy to tune up on the higher bands so you have to have to be careful with them so that's uh, 900 watts on uh, 15 meters we have plenty of tuning time with this right now we're at 2000 volts the voltage would be the same but the um, this is with the pulsar and I'll go to the carrier and Let's see what the carrier says. The carrier says 750 watts without retuning. We're about 600 milliamps on the plate current. And we're about, uh, oh, 1700 volts or so, a little over 1700 volts on high voltage. So efficiency is still good. And it's nice having the 572s because I don't have to worry about popping tubes uh, while I'm tuning up. I'll go to 28 megahertz now for the final test. This is the worst band for these amplifiers. They they really don't work that well with 4811s in them and up on 10 meters because they're not neutralized and they um, they just uh, have a lot of things that are that could be better. So here's 15 meters, or excuse me, this is 10 meters. And we'll try to peak it back up. And a little backlash in the controls, which makes them a little hard to adjust. There we go. So there's 900 watts PEP. SWR is still like 1.1 or 1.2 to 1 uh, with just two 572s in it with the other mods. And then we'll go to a carrier and let's see where we're at. I don't know. Let's see. Twenty-eight one hundred eight is where we're at with the side band. So for the carrier, we'll go to same thing. Twenty-eight one hundred eight. There we go. So seven hundred and fifty watts a carrier, and we're at six hundred milliamps. So everything's working good.